So I'm going to cover similar ground. About, um, I, like a lot of people, well, possibly not that many, but a number of us anyway, we got very interested in economics around the time of the uh, economic crash um, in 2008, I think it was, uh, when it seemed that the old paradigm was broken and um, it was time for some really searching questions of uh, the model that we had. Unfortunately, uh, the, the mainstream economics didn't really provide those answers, so people like myself went on a journey to figure them out themselves. And I came across uh, a 19th century American economist called Henry George, who made an awful lot of sense to me. Uh, and as a result, I went and set up a, um, a little promotional group here in uh, Devon called the Henry George Society of Devon. Um, and there's a number of members of that group here today. Uh, we've, we've, we've been going a year now and um, our membership is, uh, well, it's, it's going up. Uh, anyway, I'll make a start. Um, so the subject of my talk is uh, the economics of sharing the earth. Um, and I wanted to start with a quote uh, from Buckminster Fuller. We should do away with the absolutely specious notion that everybody has to earn a living. It is a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. Now that resonates with uh, quite a lot of people. It, 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 it's a question that's not actually asked a lot nowadays, but um, when you think about technology and the, the, the amazing capacity of technology to make our lives easier, it, it does raise the question, um, is it working for us? Um, Buckminster Fuller certainly thought that it should, um, we should all be benefiting from uh, by having more leisure time and it's an idea uh, John Maynard Keynes also uh, talked about in the 1930s. He boldly predicted in the depths of the, the Great Depression that uh, his grandchildren would be working 15 hours a week um, and have a life of leisure. Um, and, and some of you may have uh, seen uh, the 1960s American cartoon called, um, what's it called again, The Jetsons. Um, in that, in that cartoon series, which was set in the uh, 100 years from when it was made, which was the uh, 2060, uh, George Jetson, the father of the household, worked nine hours a week. Uh, the mother of the household, who was a homemaker, in keeping with 1960s um, reality, didn't actually do any work because the robot did it all for her. So they just uh, had an easy life. So that, that's the way things potentially could be, but the question is, are we going in that direction? Is, is that how things are unfolding? And um, there seems to be a lot of evidence that it's not. That we're actually working more in order to keep a roof over our heads. Um, we are, um, yeah, a lot of us are struggling. And um, I mean, there was an American economist uh, recently, Tyler Durden, who uh, said that, um, he said that the, technolo the technology that we're now developing is killing off the middle class. It's, it's, we've gone from robots replacing production workers in factories, now we're moving to a position where automation is replacing bank workers, people who work in hospitals, people who work in universities. These secure jobs are no longer secure anymore. So the people are being faced with uh, the reality of either having to upskill in order to benefit from these developments, um, in order to be on the right side of the ledger when it comes to introduction of new technology, or they're going to be pushed down into the low wage group which is growing and growing. Um, the great majority of jobs that are being created nowadays um, are minimum wage or, or thereabouts. Um, so basically the government's having to step in. People are working 40 hours a week, two income earners working 40 hours a week and they're still only just getting by. The government's coming in with tax credits trying to prop up the, uh, the model uh, so that people can scrape by even though they're working full time. So um, I think there was, a, there was a study by someone recently who said um, that during the during times of high wages in the Middle Ages, the peasants then actually had a had a had a life of far greater leisure than, than we do today. So these, this is this is the, the question that I want to answer is why don't we have a Jetsons economy? Why is it that we sort of seem to be struggling against just trying to break even, um, trying to keep our heads above water? Which is essentially this slide here. Um, we see, the, we see the, the dividing line, the top half the way that it should be, the bottom half possibly the way that it is. Um, so that's the question that I'd like to ask, and, and, I, and it's not a question that mainstream economics has got an awful lot to say about. 
Uh, they, don't, they don't really attempt to answer that one. Um, and, um, but I wonder, does economics somewhere have an answer to it? And uh, hopefully, um, I'll, I can provide some clues tonight. Uh, that, that's what I'll attempt to do anyway. Right, let's start from the beginning. Um, big picture, what is economics really all about? Uh, a lot of e talk about economics gets bogged down in detail, uh, awfully complex, um, doesn't actually sort of start at a fundamental level and ask the question, well, what, what is economics? Um, I've got a quote here from um, Wikipedia. Economics is the social science that analyzes the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. But um, my take on it's a little bit different. I think economics is about working. Economics is about earning a living. Essentially, you work, you create goods, you exchange what you make for what someone else makes, you do what you're good at, they, they do what they're good at, and together you reciprocate and both benefit from an economic, um, economic cooperation in that way. So to me, at a basic level, economics should be about working to make, make your life better, to, to satisfy your needs and have a few luxuries as well. Um, and on this slide here you see this, uh, Iron Age and the Modern Age, and to me, the same principles are in play whether you're in the Iron Age or whether you're in the Modern Age. It's still the same fundamental economic principles that are going on. Um, I think sometimes we get a bit carried away with how complex things are nowadays, but when you really pick it apart, it's, it's, it's the same basic principle. Uh, what we see here, land, labour and capital are the three factors of production. Um, land, labour interacts with land and capital to create wealth. Uh, this, is a, this, is, um, this is a way of looking at economics that comes from the classical economists of the 19th century or just before uh, um, Adam Smith and later Ricardo, um, John Stuart Mill. This is the way that they looked at economics. So you have these three distinct categories, um, factors of production. Definition is very important. Uh, land is actually more than just the land. It's actually um, the whole of the natural world. So when we talk about earth sharing, the subject of this talk, land is the earth. Um, so it includes the sea, it includes the magnetic spectrum, it includes minerals under the ground. Essentially everything that is not made by human hand is land. That's, that's the economic definition that I'm using. Labour is obviously uh, the work of people's work. Capital, uh, in the sense of, it's often misused, but the way that it's defined here is tools, basically, machinery. Um, there's a little feedback arrow you can see there, which is wealth that is reused, wealth that is created and then reused in to further more production. That's the definition of capital. So under this model, um, Essentially, everything's good. We, as, as I said before, we all exchange the services of our labour um, and create the things that we want and need. The laws of supply and demand work fine to moderate the whole thing. That's Adam Smith's invisible hand, um, whereby the demand for certain goods gets, the price and the demand get met so that, um, yeah, that people's work gets distributed where it's to create um, goods and services that people want and people get a fair reward for that. That's a good model but um, except we have the, this thing called private property of land um, and that is essentially the bogeyman you might want to call it. Um, that's, where, that's where that model of, um, um, of, a, of, a, of a properly operating market suddenly gets, um, runs into problems. Uh, when some, when when some people claim ownership of land and say this is mine, land is a finite resource. Land is a res land, the natural world. You need access to you need access to the natural world in order to in order to participate in economics, in order to produce. So when someone owns it, they're stopping others from from using it, and there's none there's none left anymore. It's all taken basically. There's no free land available. So that's a problem when we when we think about the three factors of production. And then we introduce the, on top of that the idea of ownership of land. And what we're talking about basically is the creation of rent. 
Um, and rent is a key concept that we, we need to understand in order to um, address the issue that I raised at the start. That's where I'm heading with this. It, it might sound a bit technical, but essentially I'm trying to explain why it is that we haven't got a life of leisure when, uh, we, when everyone, where, whereby everyone can benefit from uh, the yeah, production um, and economic development. So I'll just go through this uh, law of rent. Um, some of you probably already know it. Uh, it's, it's basically what we see here are four grades of land, the most valuable on that side, and um, the least valuable on the other side. First person comes along, of course, they choose the valuable land, that's where they get the most uh, return for their work. So they create in a year by working that piece of land four bushels, or whatever you want to call it, of production, because the land is most productive. So that's the return for the work that they put in. Second person comes along, they choose the next most productive piece of land, three bushels of production. Um, and what we see here is that um, something called rent all of a sudden exists, whereby uh, the return for labor is three bushels, but on the, on the, on the most valuable land, the, the first person who arrived can suddenly claim one bushel of rent. And that's quite simple because, simply because if he, say, the, the first book guy's got a bad back and he can't work, and he says, well, actually, can you work my land for me? The next guy will say, well, I could do, but it'll have to be a fair deal for me because I can work over there for three bushels. So you'll have to pay me three bushels. So that's, that's, that, that sets the level of wages, basically. The wages are set at three, rent is one. So as pr predictably, another person turns up and then takes the next slice of land, we see that uh, wages falls to two bushels, because that's the return you get for working on the land that's freely available. Um, and rent goes up to, respectively, one and two bushels in the better grade of land. And to complete the picture, the final grade of land is brought into production, a fourth person turns up, wages drop to one bushel. If you want someone to work your patch, you have to pay them one bushel because otherwise they'll go to the, 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 the other, you know, that, that's, that's the market rate is set by what we call the margin of production, which is the least productive piece of land. So what this basically tells us is that the return on labor and the, and the return on rent, and rent, which is the return on owning land, are related to each other. And it's a key concept that um, explains an awful lot of um, economic uh, well, basically, when you look at the world around you and you understand this concept of rent, a lot of, a lot of things start to make sense in terms of um, how land gets its value and the relationship of work to rent. Okay, um, we'll move on. Um, rent is land value, essentially. Uh, if there are no people, land has no value. If there's one person, land still has no value. So as soon as there are two people laying claim to land, land has a value. The best land has a higher value. Um, so land values are highest where there are the most people, which are in cities, obviously. Um, so the model we saw was, was an agricultural example to explain the concept of rent, but the concept actually works equally so in advanced societies in, in uh, the world cities, London, New York, wherever, um, the concept of rent is still at play. The most productive location to be is in the centre of a big city. In fact, agricultural production is just peanuts compared to the value of land in the middle of a big city. We're talking factors of tens of thousands more per square foot of land or however you want to measure it. Um, so that's a key concept. Um, essentially, land is created by the community, the, la the land value is created by the community. It's a community created wealth. So, um, yeah, people create the value, give, people give value to land. And it's an unearned, uh, the people who own land don't actually create that value themselves. That value is created by everyone else. 
and all the economic activity that's going ar on around them. Yes. Hull. I haven't never been to Hull, no. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Anyway, what causes land values to rise? Um, population growth does. An expanding workforce. Technological innovation. New infrastructure. Increased efficiency. Education. Less corruption, etc. Lots of things cause land values to go up. But... Um, I guess the point I'm making is that a lot of these things that cause the land values to go up are government policy. The government wants to achieve these things, uh, particularly, I mean, we think it's great that we have an educated workforce, don't we? But there's a, there's a side effect of having an educated workforce that's greater productivity, increases land values. And, I mean, I think the best example of this is, is um, when uh, the workforce was boosted by, when women started to uh, join the workforce in large numbers following the Second World War, uh, it created enormous, an economic boost, but the effect of that was to drive land prices up. And essentially that explains why, um, what, where, back in the 1950s, you could buy a house with just one person earning, you know, just an average wage. Nowadays, both people have to uh, work extremely hard um, to afford the same house. So... I guess, what, I guess what we're seeing here is um, the answer to the question, which is a ratcheting up of pressure on, uh, on work, which is why we actually never get ahead. So the politicians might say, we need growth, we need this, we need that, we need the HS2. Uh, you know, Birmingham's going to get connected up to London and it's all going to be great and we're going to create these jobs. The effect is actually going to be the same process of just ratcheting up land values, whereby a lot of people are not actually going to be any better off for that, that so-called progress. Or if they are, they'll be certainly working hard for it. They're not going to have the life of leisure, the Jetson economy. Right. So that's the problem. Solved. I hope, I hope that makes some sense. Um, you know, you can explain it a number of different ways. So hopefully hopefully uh, you understood that way. But uh, essentially what we're saying is the economic pogue the economic pie grows, production increases, but an ever greater slice of that production is claimed by rent, i.e. by the owners of land. So that although, although we've got more, the percentage that goes to rent just keeps increasing under those conditions. And I mean, to go back to Hull, you have an economic collapse, and yet you actually have a reversal of the process where rent goes down. I mean, you see it in... Um, Places where there's, for example, the San Francisco earthquake uh, of 1900 and whatever it was, flattened the city. The city was very quickly rebuilt, and at the time, the value, the value, um, wages went up, and everyone had a job, and it was a great time in terms of community building because there was no rent because the city was kind of flattened. And you see that in, in, the, in the aftermath of the Second World War. I think E. F. Schumacher was writing about uh, growing up in an Austrian village just after the Second World War, it was, it was year zero in terms of the economy. There was no rent, and under those conditions, everyone was sort of on an equal footing. You got, everyone could muck in and work and, and got, a, got maximum return for their efforts. So the economic conditions in, those, in, in that sort of scenario, is, um, is, there's a lot of freedom involved. But as the economy advances and um, things get more and more organised, um, and, yeah, basically land values go up, rent goes up, and we end up with situation. I think another example is, just, is Berlin, uh, when the wall fell down. I was talking to a friend of mine who lived there, and um, it was a great time. It was, it was sort of an anarchist paradise. There was very little rules, very few rules, um, and it was a great time, creative time. But if you can compare that time, 1991, 92, 93, to now in Berlin, everyone's complaining about the high rents, and it's killing creativity. So these, these, there's lots of um, ramifications of this process. It can be explained in many ways. Essentially, an ever greater slice of um, economic production is claimed by rent. Wages fail to keep up. Um, and that's done 
another way of looking at it is that the supply of land is fixed. It's, it's inelastic in the economic terms. So that usually when you have more demand, that stimulates supply to meet demand. And you have a sort of price curve which reflects that process. But with land, you can't increase supply because it's fixed. Uh, and when you have a situation of economic growth, it's, it's, that's the reason why land claims a bigger and bigger, bigger, supply, uh, bigger um, share of the spoils, if you will. Right, so the, the, the net effect of all that is inequality increases because some people own the land and benefit from the rise of values and others don't and they have to sell their wages at, at whatever they can get for it um, in order to, um, just to, yeah, just to provide for themselves the basics of, the basics of their lives. So um, we have a rise in inequality and we have um, those that, that are at, really at the margin are hit with uh, poverty. And when we have a welfare system, that kind of puts a, a check on how, how low you can go. But if you take the, the prop out of a welfare system, you just keep going down to situations where in some parts of the world, I mean Indonesia or places like that, where it's pretty grim if you're at the bottom, if you're really at the, at the absolute margin, you're on the, on the, on the verge of starvation. Um, so this is just a little bit more about economic rent. Essentially, that's a term that's used in economics, and it has... It, it's not just to do with land, it's, um, it's an econ but essentially um, it's income without a corresponding cost of production is, is, is economic rent. So those who own, if you own a piece of paper that says I've got title to this, you don't have to work because you can, by having title to something, other people, you can actually take a cut from what other, pe other people's earnings. So it's, um, yeah, as I said before, scarcity or the lack of increase in supply is what creates economic rent. You can see it with football salaries that you know, there's, there's inelastic supply of absolute top footballers like uh, Ronaldo or whoever. So their, 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 their salaries are astronomical as a result because there's only one of them. They're unique or, or top movie stars. So um, that's scarcity, the rule of scarcity kicking in, um, which creates a situation where economic rent can be claimed. So it's also, it's all, it's also considered to be a, a monopoly privilege. Um, the ability to earn unarmed, to earn income and appropriate the wealth produced by others. Enough of that. Um, right, so what's the solution to that? Uh, and I've got there, to adopt an economic system that recognises that the earth belongs to everyone. And I'll just read the quote by Henry George there. The equal right of all men to use the land is as clear as their equal right to breathe the air. It is a right proclaimed by the fact of their existence. For we cannot suppose that some men have a right to be in this world and others no right. So that's essentially uh, summarizing the fact that when you're born on this earth, that gives you rights to the earth. Um, and and it's, it's an idea, it, it's, this, what I've been talking about is, is, has been termed the land problem. And it's, it's, it's not, it's nothing new, it's, it's, you can go right back into the, the myths of time and you'll find the same similar sort of thoughts about concerning ownership of the land. Unfortunately, it's, it's our, the economic discourse we have, the mainstream economy of economics of today completely ignores it, but it's, it's sort of, it's, it's the elephant in the room, it's sitting there um, staring everyone in the face, um, and it always has been. I mean, it, you can go back to the, um, the mosaic rules of, of ancient Israel. They had ev every, um, every 49th or 50th year was, um, was a jubilee year, whereby land ownership was sort of re redistributed back to the way it originally was because things get out of kilter with uh, land ownership, whereby people are getting exploited. I think every seventh year they have a... Um, they, they wipe all debts, and every 49th or 50th year they, they uh, revert to the original land ownership of the tribe, tribal settlement in order to sort of start again because you have a growing inequality and it, ha and it has to be addressed. Um, but Confucius had things to s similar sentiments as uh, this one here. Um, uh, another, Spinoza in the, in the Middle Ages um, had something to say about it as well. Um, Thomas Paine was, uh, had, had a lot to say about it. The physiocrats of uh, France in the 18th century, they had a lot to say about it. These ideas have been there all along, but we kind of have ignored them in the modern age. 
Um, and that's really why I'm here to say, hey, it's about time we had another look at them because there's a great fundamental wisdom there. So um, sharing the earth, the economics of sharing the earth, what, what can you do about it? Well, I've got three possible options here. There are probably more. Um, one might be land redistribution or land national, nationalization, but I'm not in favor of that. <laughs> Simply, I mean, uh, as, as I said, in the Jubilee of, of ancient Israel, you might say that that's a, that's a form of, um, of that solution. Um, so maybe it, maybe it would work, but it's, it's logistically incredibly difficult to pull off. Um, and um, yeah, and, and the problem with it really is that when you have, um, you, might have you might have solved the problem once um, for, for today's generation, but you have new households appearing all the time, so they have to then grab their slice of land and, and you're constantly rejigging who owns what and um, because you have an evolving picture of, of, of people, population. So it's a, anyway, very difficult. So the other two are land value tax, community land trusts. Um, right, I'll go into, I'll, oh yeah, get a move on. Um, what happens if we capture land values? There's a lot of way, there's a lot of arguments you can make in favor of um, land value tax. It works on so many different levels. It works when you have uh, local governments that can't afford to provide services. Uh, it's a so it's source of income. The, the idea about land value tax is that it's a tax shift. It's not an additional tax to what we already have. But what you're doing is you're replacing um, the tax on labor, income tax. You're, you're, you're replacing the tax on uh, corporations. Um, all, 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 you're basically, you're replacing all those taxes which are economically inefficient with a land value tax. Um, and that's what we see here in these two pie charts. Um, at the moment, rent is privatized, tax comes out of the earnings of labor and capital, and so there's, there's not, a, there's not well, a little bit less than half, according to this pie chart, left for uh, people to, as a return on their work. Uh, whereas if we shift to land value tax, that means that we get rid of the uh, inefficient taxes, we take public revenue from rent, um, ground rent, and that means there's a lot more left over. So essentially, people get a full return on their um, their earnings. Um, Yeah. Right. Yeah, sure. Well, the first thing to understand with land value tax is you're segregating the value of, of buildings from land. Um, and um, so you identify the rental value of the land itself, um, and that's what, that's what you levy a tax on. And that... That's right. Yeah. So whoever owns the land pays the tax. And what happens when you have absentee landlords, for example, they own land but they're not using it personally, they're renting it out to someone else, the tax would fall on them. And there would actually be no benefit for them to own that land because, um, yeah, because you, only, you only own land if you want to use it productively. And that's one of the benefits. Um, so that's, that's the big picture. Uh, you could go, there's lots of arguments about land. When land value rises uh, because of, for example, HS2, the, the, the high speed train infrastructure, uh, what happens in the current situation is we all pay for that out of our taxes, um, which from our earnings, from our labor, and but the benefit accrues to those who own land in and around the stations at the terminus of, of the, of the and, there's been studies done about the Jubilee Line in London which show very clearly how building this extremely expensive piece of public infrastructure really benefited owners of land next to the stations of the Jubilee Line. So when, when you have a land value tax, it's a, it, you take the revenue from those who profit from the infrastructure. Um, there's a whole principle in economics called the Henry George Theorem which pretty much says that public investment in infrastructure 
uh, it can be funded from the rise in the, the value of land that, that those investments make. When you think about what makes land values high, schools, hospitals, public facilities, all these things that are paid for by the public make a, make a place nice to live and boost the land values. So the logical source of taxation to pay for those things is, um, is, is land value. Um, essentially, another way of looking at it, it's, it's not a tax as such, but it's a due. What you're doing, and this is, this is where the principle of earth sharing comes in, um, it's the embodiment of earth sharing, this, this particular tax, if you want to call it that. Because um, when you own, take ownership of land, like we said earlier, the slide earlier, you take ownership of private property, of, of land, you're, you are stopping others from using that land. You're saying, okay, everyone's got a right to the earth, but this bit is mine. That's fine, because you need that security of tenure to be able to develop your enterprise, whatever it might be. But um, you need to pay compensation to the rest of the, of the population for, for excluding them from that piece of land. And Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and that's why, and so it's a community create land is a community created value. Therefore, it's the rightful source of public revenue. Yes. They haven't got a what? Sorry. Well, um, I mean, the market, the market gives, as I understood it, how, how you capture the value, well, well, right, I mean, what value, the market operating gives, gives land, it's, uh, gives land its value, which then can be measured by value, by value with, um, Well, essentially, you levy the you levy the tax. You identify the owner of the land and say, "Well, you owe this much money because your land is valued at uh, at this rate." And if they don't pay, I think that I think that they probably lose their land. Right. Well, there's different models. Yeah. Okay. There are different models of what to do with the money. I mean, you can you can levy it for local government. You can levy it at central government. But I mean, there are people who argue that the best thing to do with it is just to pay it out as a citizen's dividend and let just, in the same way that the Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, oil revenues in Alaska, oil is recognized to be a commons, so they take the money from, from, the, from what's basically the rent, the, once they've subtracted the cost of producing the oil, they've got this value left over, which is free value, and they give it to all the citizens of Alaska, and then they can do what they want with it. And what, so one model is, and this is, this is what, um, what, you, what geo-libertarians like to do, they like small government, they say just give it as a, uh, pay it out to every individual as a citizen's dividend, let them spend, and, and don't pay for public education, let, them, let people use that money to buy their education. This is, this is a whole level of argument about what, what model would, would work best, but the point is that once you take, take the um, land value as your source of public revenue, and make, you make it public, then um, you, you eliminate an awful lot of inequality that we currently have. Um, so all these solutions probably uh, all have their merit. Anyway, I'll just move on. Um, I promised Jay that I'd say something about community land trusts. Um, it's not my specialist area, but I can understand why Jay wanted something to be said about that because 
people in, in the transition movement, are, um, they're really keen to do something practical now. And it's one thing to be all political and say we should have a land value tax, but that you can't really do much. There's such a big political leap required. And rather than wait until, uh, until our civilization has evolved to the point where we realize it's the, it's the best solution, what can we do now? And one of the things that people are doing now is, is community land trusts. Um, it goes back to um, Ralph Basodi in the 1920s in the United States. He was actually uh, influenced by Henry George. Um, and he got fed up with waiting for land value tax to arrive. So he went and, and, and set up this thing called uh, the School of Living. Um, and it was a back to the land movement, in some ways rejecting the... Uh, rejecting the, um, the city and all its problems and going back to the land and, and, and homesteading it, as, as they like to call it. Um, right, so that, that, that's a bit of historical background on community land trusts. But um, if, you go, if you go and look up the School of Living, there's, um, there, are, there are interesting resources there about, um, well, for example, a lease agreement based on land rent. So they're trying to implement the principles of earth sharing of capturing that rent and sharing it among the community by the way that they draw up their, their lease agreement. So they're very conscious of the whole background of the, what, you know, what, what I was talking about earlier, the land problem and, and what, why it is that we've got a boot on our throats the whole time and it's, it's, a, it's a way to try and respond to that um, by setting up community land trust which essentially captures that value of the land and rather than allow it some people to profit, profit from it, we share, we share that value. And, and, um, so that's Community Land Trust and, and it's a growing movement in the UK and uh, Jay's already said that there'll be a speaker here, I didn't catch whether it was next week, um, Pat Connerty, who's, who's listed here on my slide, um, who's going to say a lot more about it. So it's not my specialist area but I do recognise that it's one of those possible responses to, um, it's, it's something that you can do here and now as a response but, uh, to, to, the, to the issue of land rent. Um, to me it's not, it's, not a, it's not as good a response as land value tax because it'll, uh, community land trusts will always just benefit a small minority who are kind of lucky enough or active enough to set things up whereas it will leave the, the vast majority of people to still have to f um, fight, for, fight for their a piece of uh, land on the open market. In fact, it could exacerbate the situation because you take land out of the open market and, and make it safe in perpetuity through a community land trust. That means there's less land available for people who aren't lucky enough to profit from that land trust in order for them to try to establish their businesses or their homes so it can actually increase the pressure for those that are excluded. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's possibly uh, in the current day and age the best one we've got uh, and there's certainly a lot of people who are going down that route and looking at it. Uh, right, and there's the South Devon group, uh, the Land Society, uh, who are also um, active. So just to w right, uh, wind up my talk, the concluding comments, um, I say that we should revisit classical economics and understand the law of rent. To me that's really important uh, a really important idea that's been lost and we need to get it back. Um, I think there's a tendency by some nowadays to think well that's the sort of thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. They think that the old economics, the, the scientific, the, the efforts to be scientific about economics have all proven to be completely um, wrong Whereas I say you're in danger there of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, and there's some really valuable insights that we that we should get, and that's that's I mean there's this thing about using your left brain or your right brain. I think we should use our left brain to to want to get our head around this um, because it's because it's really important. Um, so if if there's one thing um, you know I'd like you to leave here to, is with an understanding of the difference between productive and parasitic economic behaviour. It doesn't suit the powers that be, the establishment, the, uh, the vested interests uh, that sort of uh, rule the roost in our society today. It doesn't suit them to talk about this difference, but it's something that you can easily see and, um, 
and understand that there are parasites and there are productive people and we need to have economic policies that favour productive people and that don't allow parasites to thrive, which is completely different from what, we've, what we have now. Um, reclaim the commons, essentially that's, that's what it's all about, it's the whole history of the commons, the enclosures, uh, taking the commons, land out of the commons and there are a lot of people now who are, who are um, looking to reclaim the commons uh, and, this is, and, and the ideas that I've been talking about today are part of that. Um, and I also see this, as, I haven't talked about the environment at all in my talk, but this is, this is the key one for me, that I don't think we're going to solve the environmental crisis until we solve the, the issue of the land problem, because it's, it's, it's the, the, um, the pressure that we all feel by the land problem that makes us sort of go stir crazy and, and damage the environment, do whatever we have to do to put a roof over our heads, um, and environmental considerations are then secondary when it's about feeding your family. So we really have to look at this uh, in, uh, in, um, in a holistic way and understand that it's, it's part of the solution. Um, and that, that's, that's actually, th that way of thinking is the opposite of Neo-Malthusianism, which kind of thinks there's too many of us. Um, and that's the problem. That's not the problem at all. There's, there's plenty of resources in the world it's just a case of if you take, as I use the, the metaphor of the boot at the throat, if you take the boot off the throat, then we can all thrive and we can all find balance and we can make much wiser decisions about how we treat the natural environment. We won't be destroying ecosystems because we won't have to and we'll see the, the true value of nature, which we don't at the moment because we are, um, because we're, we're basically, it's sink or swim time. At, um, and yeah, that's my next point really. The private appropriation of community created value lies at the heart of the dog eat dog economic paradigm that we have. Um, and I just think that um, once we solve this problem, things, it, it's, it, it, will, it will represent the transformation of, um, the transformation of society and um, in a way, in, in some ways, uh, making the next stage uh, of our evolution towards being much more, um, much more contented um, and um, evolved beings. And I think John is going to say a bit more about that next. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. I'm not going to take up very much of your time, just 10 minutes or something, just to, just to give you um, a, a different perspective, you know, a, just a, well, another perspective. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, John T. Williams. I'm, I'm also the, the, the co-founder of the Henry George Society, and we've got a couple of, a couple of other members who've been there sort of when, since day one, actually, haven't we? So <laughs> we formed it uh, at, at, um, at a meeting last, last year. But... Um, so I'm just going to give you a little, I'll just introduce you a, a, a little bit as to who I am and where I come from. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I've got a project over at Bickington um, called the, the Husbandry School, which is, which is to do with husbandry being um, the people-to-place relationship and the art of managing it. And it is very, very relevant to, to these ideas of Henry George. Um, I'll just tell you a little, I was just walking around the, um, uh, we're, we're on, actually on the top of a hill, uh, sort of between Ashburton and, and, and Newton Abbott, and it's actually a near, it's an old Neolithic settlement that has been abandoned for a lot of time, uh, and uh, we took it on, it's sort of very neglected agricultural land, and uh, I was just walking around there last night, um, there, was a bit of, there was a bit of moon out, and you could just see in the moonlight some of the... Um, the remains of the old Neolithic boundaries, um, and uh, it sort of it sort of brings it into a bit of perspective that that what I'm going to try and do is just to bring bring these whole these whole uh, points about about Georgism, Henry George's ideas, into a sort of first principles of us as humans and the land that we need to to use to get our, our um, livelihoods off. Um, 
the bit of land I was walking on is actually uh, um, it's, it's part of um, uh, we've got an agricultural tenancy on it, uh, and so so we know about the actual rental value of land, so how, how much it costs to use land, and we're 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 a user of it, and we pay fifty pound an acre for the agricultural rent. Now, of course, we pay it to our landlady. Our landlady is the landowner. Now, if you sort of wind, I just want to wind back this whole principle of, of land ownership and, and where it originates. And if you, if you think right back to the sort of beginnings of, of humanity, the beginnings of agriculture, in order to be able to use a bit of land, we have to put a fence around it, okay? Because you can't grow vines or, you know, keep sheep, you know, keep, you, you have to put a fence around it to defend it. You defend it against you know, the rest of nature. You defend it against whatever might come and eat your crops. Okay? So, so this is the, like the first fundamental pri priority of any land use, is to put a fence around it. Now it's the question of how we defend that fe those fences. And all through history, it seems like um, Cain and Abel was the first, first sort of example that, that I've got from, since we're in the church, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll go a bit biblical. Cain, Cain, um, uh, Cain was a wandering shepherd, and Abel, if I've got, the right, if I've got it right, right way round, um, was a settled farmer. He was a tiller of the soil, grew, grew, his, grew his vines, and, uh, um, and, and they, um, they got into a quarrel, basically, because... I think Abel wanted to walk his sheep through the, um, where Cain was growing his crops and Cain had put this big fence around it. Anyway, they got into an argument, Cain killed Abel, didn't he? Um, so, so this sort of issue of, if you're going to look after a bit of land, you need to have a fence around it. How do you defend that fence? Who, who, how, how do you deal with somebody who is now being deprived of that land? And the only solution I think society has ever come up with is to defend it militar militarily. You know, you know, Cain killed Abel, so Abel started started um, building a building a, a, a warrior culture. You know, to defend the land. Now, what Georgism, what George, what, what Henry George's sort of genius, I think, was to say, hang on, land has a user value. That user value can be easily determined. You know, our local valuers can determine. And it's determined by whoever's using it at the moment and whoever wants to use it and what they would be willing to pay each year to use that piece of land. Okay? And that becomes the user value of land. And if we're going to, be, if we're going to treat the people who we are depriving of exclusive use of land properly and respectfully, then we need to compensate them to the full value and not aim guns at them, basically, which is what we do at the moment. All our title deeds, I mean, I, on, the, on our hilltop, like I say, we, we rent that piece of land, we pay that rent to our landlady. Our landlady owns the right of that piece of land through the legal system that, that we've set up and it is ultimately defended by the military industrial sort of legal... Uh, uh, system which underpins our, our legal title deeds. And of course, next to that piece of land, we also own, so-called own, a piece of land. And, and what I feel that, that husbandry, you know, as a, as, as a sort of proper relationship to, to land has to offer, um, is a sort of, a, 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 just a, a realisation that land is not something that we can own. It's something that we have a, a lifetime's tenure of, or we could have a, you know, we could have a secure lifetime's tenure of land, um, but we need to, we need to, we need to die in, and we need to, to hand it over in, you know, to, to, to some, to, to, you know, whoever follows. And also to, to realise that um, it's, 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 it's ethically wrong. Um, the, um, this, this sort of concept of sharing the earth, you couldn't just po po put up your little slide of the uh, private property, it was just sort of, uh, sort of, sort of illustrate. I'm going to st steal Peter's slides as well because I didn't, go, didn't, didn't, didn't make any, but 
it, yeah, just yeah, just to keep out. That's it. That, that'll just just as a background. Here. Um, so, you know, you know, it, 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 earth sharing has got a has got um, uh, an ethical dimension. So it, its ethical dimension is a proper respecting of whatever is outside the fences that we need to put around us in order to create value. Now, whether I mean I'm 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 a farmer and a, and a, and a, and a uh, we, 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 we do teaching as well, but, it, but it's, um, that, that's one piece of land use. But exactly the same would apply whether I was building a nuclear power station. You need a fence around it. You know? if, you, if, if you're going to do something economically productive, you need to be able to exclude other people from it. And a proper, a proper ethical dimension to land tenure is to say, I will... I want exclusive use of this land in order to compensate you, and by you I mean the whole ecology, the whole community, not just people, but it's, 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 um, it's the whole environment. Compensate them for my exclusive use of land by a fee exactly equal to what other people would be prepared to pay for that year's use of that piece of land, you know, and it's, it, it's actually quite simple if you think of it in, that, in, in those terms, rather than having land rights which are only defended by our military, and that is the bottom line of, of, of land title as we have it, and as we've had it all the way through the ages, all the way since Cain, Cain and Abel. So, um, I mean, I think uh, there's just one other little sort of um, little point I'd just like to, to finish with, just a couple of quotes, and, 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 and one is from um, uh, a friend um, who's also in the Henry George movement called uh, Frank, Pe Frank Peddle, who's a, who's a, um, a phil um, philosophy professor at, um, at um, Ontario University, um, and he just says a couple of little quotes. It's, it's a simple fiscal transfer. It's a simple fiscal adjustment that we need to make, a simple and transparent solution for a vast complex of affronts to the, homo, to the common good. And he finishes, um, this is in an article he just wrote on the, on the um, campus magazine in, in, in Ontario, Ottawa, is it Ont Ottawa University? Um, he said, it is in the very nature of things that those people and organisations that dominate nature for their own private interests without adequately compensating the rest of society will find their edifices built on uncertain ground. And one last thing I'll just finish with is, is a quote from uh, Wendell Berry um, who says, there's, n there's no such thing as sacred and unsacred parts of the world there is only sacred and desecrated. So this sort of idea that, that, you know, there are so many neglected parts of the world that we see around us. I mean, you just, just walk down, you know, the back, back of the River Dart, you know, there's sort of, there's, there's ex-industrial estates, there's, there's bits of, you know, spiked railings with tear, holes torn in them by the local kids, you know. There's lots of desecrated places. And in, um, this sort of this sort of need for for action, uh, the action being to align the economic motivation that all of us have to have. Like Peter said, you know, we knew, we all need to do something to put a roof over our head and to put food on the table. So this align our economic motivation with our need to nurture the earth. Right? These are sort of two at the moment they're opposing. You, you know, if you, want to, if you want to get on economically, you have to put aside stewardship, nurturing, you know, husbandry of the earth. If you want to, the, uh, uh, and what I want to, want, to, want to leave you with is, is that the, it's the economic system that is, that is wrong, not our, our desire to nurture the earth. So I, I want to say that if we want to do something about this, we actually just get on and nurture a bit of neglected part of the planet that any of us can, you know, are familiar with. We actually get on and, and just do it 
it's, it's against our economic interests, we know that, but it's because the economic interests are wrong. Um, in, in, in actually doing it, you know, in actually sort of, sort of, you know, just getting on and tilling a bit of ground, tending with a bit of, te bit of tenderness, um, a bit of the earth, we can actually undermine that, that economic system and we can create a demand for stewardship tenure of the earth in, you know, we can just, we, we can actually just, we can actually do it, you know, I, I, and I feel that, it's, that, it, that it could develop into a movement, like an Occupy movement, but, but we occupy in a sort of respectful and uh, uh, an agricultural manner, looking after, you know, with, you know, looking at the sort of ecologies that we, that we need to, to nurture with a bit of um, love and respect. Um, and, and I think we can, you know, we can turn this economic system upside down and, and if we actually just go on and do these sort of things, us who are privileged and able to, in some ways, go against our own economic interests in order to, I mean, you know, I keep sheep on this little bit of ground up there and it's not economic to keep sheep on a piece of, on, on a piece of, on a piece of land that, I mean, I bought, you know, this, 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 the, the bit of land next to our, our agricultural tenancy. It probably is slightly economic on our agricultural tenancy because we only pay fifty pound an acre. But on the bit that we, of land that we own uh, next to it, uh, we paid uh, something like six and a half thousand pounds for the acre. You know, it's not economic for us to keep a few sheep and grow a few potatoes on it. But you know, I feel if we just get on and do it, then enough people. There's a such a such a, a growth in. In, in urban agriculture movements, in, in movements that people want to want to do something to nurture this planet bit by bit, you know. And, and I feel that we can actually go and do it, and by doing it, we're gonna undermine this, this system where our economic interests are, 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 are misaligned with our, with our interests to, to, to nurture. Okay, so can we just, shall we? I'll, I'll finish now, that's, um, thank you very much, and then uh, we can, have a little discussion, yeah?